Good evening. You're watching Mondays with Edie Mondine. And of course, I'm Edie Mondine. It's six o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Tonight, we're going to talk about the disturbing injustice of African Americans in our prison systems. African Americans have been present in Multnomah County and as in every state and city in America, have made significant contributions to our lives, our culture, and development of this, our great America. Here in our own neck of the woods, the Pacific Northwest, with emphasis being primarily on Multnomah County, African Americans have been present since before the Oregon Territory was established. Our legacy is interwoven with the state's own history of racialized discrimination and exclusion. It is also a legacy of resistance to social and economic inequity. In the criminal justice system, here are some disturbing facts. Black Oregonians are imprisoned at a rate almost four times that of white people. And it should come as no surprise that prisons and the criminal legal systems are designed to control and dominate these particular populations. It's also not novice that black men constitute about 13% of the male population, but about 35% of those are incarcerated. What it simply boils down to is this. 1% of black people in Oregon are in the state prison system. Now, Oregon is bad, but you see this everywhere. Prisons and the criminal legal system are designed to control and dominate. And we have to be honest, even if it causes us to be uncomfortable, these systems are rooted in bigotry. We've got to be willing to openly acknowledge how we've been complicit in sustaining those structures. And that's a hard reality for some people. Here with us to discuss this most alarming topic this evening is Imam Mikhail Shabazz. Mikhail Shabazz has been appointed chair of the City of Portland Bureau of Development Services, Diversity Development and he's become a founding member and co-chair of the City of Portland All Diversity Committees. Shabazz co-founded the Oregon Islamic Chaplain Association, which is a nonprofit to provide social and religious services to Muslim men returning to community from incarceration. We know him as a public speaker, a life coach, and a cultural competency trainer for working with diverse populations of faith. Welcome, Iman Shabazz. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the name of God, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer, I am doing well. I am doing well. Well, and you thank look you. well. Well, just a reflection of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you are a legend here, for, from my view, as to... Uh, the reintake and the reentry of not just Muslim black men, but you've taken interest in all black men who've come out of this system of oppression and depression. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, I am just so honored to have you here as our guest and somebody who's willing and able to make a difference. What are your views on the system that govern people of color that make up those that are incarcerated? Well, Pastor Munda, the the, uh, the system is working as intended. Uh, it is a part, when we talk about the penal system, the correctional system, or the system of, they call it the justice system, it's, as you pointed out in your introduction, it's designed to control. And we know that we have to have some measures in place to address the uh, crime that takes place in our communities. It's not just the black community, it's the society in general. We know and understand that. There's, there's no doubt about that. There's a historical uh, precedence for 
what we have today and why we have it today. Uh, and it's systemic. And mm. that's, the, that's the issue that we, we have to look at. It's systemic. Because by the time a person ends up incarcerated in prison, there's a lot of life that have already happened. Yeah. And there's a lot of impact on that life that have happened. Not to exclude personal decisions and personal choices. Yes, sir. Uh, we have to factor that in. But I look at the imbalance, if you will, in the criminal justice system throughout the country where you have a system that is based in law to address things that have happened outside of law and to bring about some corrections and to keep society protected from uh, retrograde behavior. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, that's acceptable. I think any reasonable person can accept that we need to have those measures in place to some degree. Uh, we're going to differ on, on approach, certainly. However, when you look at the imbalance and way, the way the system itself have been weaponized yeah. against specific individuals or communities within the collective system itself, that's where the problem comes in. It's, in my mind, I'll make the analogy. If you have a bridge made from wood and all of the planks are firm, they won't bend, they're in place, and they can take you from one side of the ravine to the other side of the ravine, but it's two tracks on that bridge, and you put two individuals on that bridge, and they test the planks, and the planks look good. Mm -hmm. Visually, they look good, but one side is an artist's rendition. Yeah. There are no planks. Yes, sir. There's paper there. Yes, sir. And when you walk on that paper, your fate is inevitable. And that's what seems to be happening and have been happening for a long time in the criminal justice system. You will have a white individual or white individuals who will commit the exact same offense as a black or brown, but I'm just going to stay with the black right mm -hmm, now, mm -hmm. individuals. And this is historical. And it's also at, at epidemic proportions. And as they walk across that bridge to correct their lives, if you will, one gets a safe pass, a safe passage, and the other steps on the imitation, the artist's rendition, and falls to their demise. Mm. And that's that black man. Mm. Uh, I've had so many cases. I've worked with uh, within the prison system as a volunteer, uh, providing services, working with, trying to get individuals to uh, uh, transition out, taking information in, watching people uh, turn their lives around, correct themselves, and come back home and try to bring their families, et cetera, together. And I've seen so many cases uh, where individuals are left scarred and bitter because they have done some crime or been accused of some crime, and they will see an individual who may have been a participant in that same crime with them, but their race was different. Yeah. One walks and one stays. Wow. One gets a short sentence, one gets a long sentence. One gets consideration and the other gets none whatsoever. And that has scarred a lot of, lot of us, not to mention the uh, process itself. I take the Central Park Five that uh, in New York, mm -hmm. you know, those that's just a small example of we have so many men and women men and women that have been accused of crimes yes and who have faced long sentences and some have lost their lives yes and to find out that the system itself any system that's put together by human beings is going to have flaws in it yeah, indeed it's going to have flaws in it because we are indeed human and we're going to do the best we can to be perfect but we're going to make mistakes but there's a difference when you have a flaw manifested in a system where the intent is to be as perfect as you can be. But when you have a system that have flaws built into it yeah. as a default, yes. that's the problem. That's where you talk about that reprobate ideology. That's it. Because it becomes a manic and very anxious yes. uh, reoccurrence of a nightmare. Of a kind nightmare, of. exactly. Um, and the thing is... We all, as black men and black women in this country, no matter what our station in life is, 
we all fear that that ghost of injustice Ooh. may come after us. The ghost of injustice. The ghost of injustice Look, is always lurking. Imam, what changes must be addressed in the penal systems for people of color? And I'm glad that you talked about, uh, in specific, black. Yes. We, we talk about black and brown communities, which is, you know, there, there, there are injustices in both places. But we got to look at the absolute bottom, because when you stir from the bottom, everybody rises. Yes. What has to change now? Well, let me, uh, we've got a short period of time, so I'm going to try to get a lot out in yes, a short sir. period of time. I'm going to go to the birth process. Yes, sir. Right now, uh, there is uh, a process in place. It's called the Farm Act. Mm -hmm. Via the Farm Act, yes, sir, comes public assistance. Yes, sir. SNAPs, yes, food stamps, etc. There has been introduced into a present bill under the Farm Act. Yes, a surreptitious uh, amendment. And that surreptitious amendment says that before a person can receive public assistance to feed themselves, their family, their children, etc., that they can be tested, what is called non-suspicious testing, mm. meaning that they are drug, they have the right, in order for you to get those benefits, they, the system, if you're getting public assistance, the system has the right to test the mother test the child without their per per permission, and if they don't allow this test to take place, then they do not qualify for the benefits. The word here is non-suspicious. Yeah. There is no cause to test them. Yeah. You're looking for something. Yeah. You want to make sure that you, you, you've got, there's that ghost again. Yeah. And once you get a mother, black mother, who's uh, in need, first of all, that says a lot about her condition, she's in need of these uh, benefits, and then you start labeling her and her child without suspicion, wow. without cause. Wow. At the very gate, yes, you sir. put them in a category and say, we're going to watch you. We're sus we don't even have to have a suspicion. We're just going to take it for granted that you are one of those who we need to label. And we'll start tracking and we'll move you from the birth to the tier at some point. So when you talk about the prison system itself, the correctional system, the, 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 the penal system in this country, there are so many uh, ancillary uh, entry points that start long before a person is caught up in a crime yes, or sir. accused of a crime. Yes, sir. And it's systemic. It's throughout the system that we live in. So uh, that's what you're really, you're really facing. Because mm -hmm. everyone wants uh, individuals to be accountable, to live as good citizens, to not be stealing, robbing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when you have these built-in abnormalities yes, sir. that are racially driven, and there's no denying they're racially driven. Yes, sir. Even the war on crime, I mean the war on drugs. Yes, sir. The war on drugs was set up to target a specific race of people. Yes, sir. And that race of people are, were, and continue to be black people. Yes, sir. And the product that was used as the force monsieur, the, the reason, and the booger man that was created <laughs> was cocaine. Yes, sir. Okay. But chemically, uh, scientifically, you have crack and you have powder and they're both exactly the same. Yes, sir. And it's just the methodology of inducing yourself with it. But they created the society, the, the, the political folks and, and, and those who uh, control our thinking through uh, persuasion, through media, etc., created this image. They created an image that made even us feel that we should have ourselves locked up, yes, that it's sir. better to lock us up, and that we, that we are some kind of deviant human beings that if we allow us to continue to run free based on the image that's been given to us, yes. the suggestion that's been put in front of us, that we are not uh, redeemable. Yes, sir. And that we deserve to go to prison and spend as much of our lives as possible in prison where on the other side of that same package of cocaine, someone who is white and uh, let's say you've got brother, brother Bob from Alberta Street, 
And then you got the wolf of Wall Street. Yes, okay? sir. Yes, the sir. wolf, he's okay. Yes, sir. He's partying and he's making money. <laughs> oh, yes, and he's sir. He's snorting his cocaine, but he's in that category of, well, that's, he's a white man. We would remiss if we didn't talk about in the package of those drugs that you're speaking of, mm-hmm. that good old Coke 45. Yeah. Uh, listen, from your view, what could and should community insist that change is made in these systems. We hear a lot of one for us and a lot of single miles being out there. How can we and what should we be doing as a community to insist that these things change? Well, we have political leaders and, well, political participants, whether they're leading or not. Uh, That's one area that must be addressed mm, because mm. the laws come down through the p- political process. Uh, certainly awareness, education, and perception, the way we perceive ourselves and what things we demand for ourselves, those things have to be taken into consideration. And our, you know, we, we're struggling right now. We're in, the, in this country, the country itself is totally divided. Yes, sir. It is divided against itself. Yes, sir. So there's some uh, biblical and Quranic and uh, Judaic things that need to be looked at because we tend to not want to uh, allow uh, that perspective to have any influence in the dialogue. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, we can see uh, history repeats itself and uh, history is the best teacher. <laughs> we can see that we have some things going on that are, that are uh, directly connected to the condition of the human soul and the human spirit. Uh, and this country is not immune from uh, the type of destruction that it has helped to precipitate in other places. Yes, sir. And that destruction looks like it's coming upon us in the way that we have now seen the political uh, establishment that was once held in such awe and high esteem turn out to be a bunch of signifying monkeys mm. and, and uh, a bunch of foolishness constantly all the time. And it's all about power at the expense of whatever and, and whomever. So we have to, or we don't have to do anything, but I would suggest, and from my point of view, that as much as possible and as far as we can, we have to do, a, we should do, a self-evaluation. Yes, sir. We should do a self-evaluation. Yes, sir. Uh, because after a point in time, it t- appears to me to be uh, pointless to continue to lament over what we know have been done. Yes. And what continues to be done if we are not willing to put ourselves in a position spiritually, morally, and economically, and politically to address those things that we need to address ourselves. You know, Imam has been very kind in saying, We don't have to do nothing. If we want to live, we have to do something. And if we want to go forward, we're really going to have to do something. Absolutely. And in this up and coming election, uh, we don't need to talk about, that's a whole nother onion that we have to peel. That's right. You know, you talked about the Quranic and the uh, the Judaism and the Bible being uh, producing factors in change. Yes. How can the religious or spiritual community be more involved in ensuring that real justice and fairness in legal systems for people of color, how must we, and I'll say must we, come to the stage? Well, we should never have been off the stage, but we have been yes, sir. Uh, to some degree. If we are only interested in edif- self-edification and seeing ourselves um, uh, separated from the things that go on around us every day, then we are as much to blame as anyone else, uh, because as a person of faith, what benefit is it for me to have faith if I cannot take that faith and put it into action yes, sir. where it counts? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, the, the vision that we may have of ourselves that we can create a sa- safe space, uh, we, we have no safe space mm. unless we take that space and hold that space. And one of the things that we, we would be wise to do is to look at each other people of faith who have principles that are aligned with each other and move away from the specificity so much and deal with the principles that we are all operating on that are akin to one another and then pool our resources and and dig in, uh, not in a harsh way, but in a way that says we are going to support 
the values that we profess to believe in. And there was in within all of our scriptures and within all of our call, there was a call to the poor, there's a call to, the, to, to help the needy, there's a call to stand up for justice. Uh, these are the fundamental workings of our faith. Uh, when I go into the prison, I see young men, I see many, many, many young men. And, and by the way, I've just finally re retired from that after 30 some odd years and turned it over to a younger man. Uh, to, to, <laughs> yeah, because that's another thing we, we must do. You know, we can't, uh, we can't hold it forever. We have to be prepared to hand off what we have uh, to those who are coming and up and coming around us and trust that God has given them as much in their youth as he gave us in our youth and then give them what we have so that when we're gone, they can take ours and theirs and move this thing forward. But as a community of faith, we should be involved uh, at every level. Uh, it's not just, uh, you know, praying. Praying is beautiful. Praying is powerful. Yes, praying sir. is great. Yes, sir. But faith without action is dead. You know, faith without action is dead. So in these areas, and I have to say, I, I have to be honest, uh, Pastor Monaday, and, and, and be real, real candid. It's not like the faith community historically have not been involved. Yes, sir. You know, most of the gains that we have in America, in America in particular, most of those gains have come first from the Christian community. Yes, sir. And I'm just going to be frank about That's that. That's right. That's first right. First from the Christian community. When the Christian community dug in, took a stand, and stood for justice because they believed in Almighty God and they refused to back down to the powers in front of them be because of their belief. And they were punished. They were brutalized. Our people, and then the Muslim community. We have had yes, those sir. who have uh, taken a kind of a different approach. And, uh, That's okay. <laughs> and said, well, you know what? By any means we, necessary. We're going to stand. That's right. Exactly. But it is because of our desire to please God and to stand firmly for justice that put us in positions that we made great advances. But our advances seem to have been eased away from us. Yes. Because the more we, we used the power of faith, we used our commitment. We treasured the life beyond more than we treasured this life because we put our lives on the line because we believed in what we were doing. And, some, and many of us still do. We believe in what we were doing, but we had a greater influence. We had a greater influence over, and, and I think the people, our people in general, I know I did, saw a great hope in seeing the, the religious bodies mm -hmm. moving as a body to address issues and concerns. Were we always in agreement? No, but one thing that was apparent is we were engaged, we yes, were involved. Sir. I go into these prisons and it's few, fewer and fewer actual uh, faith community members addressing the behavior, addressing wow. the imprisonment, addressing uh, the concerns inside these prisons. Wow. It's fewer and fewer, okay? and. It's, it's not easy work, it's very difficult work, but it's still work because the ones that we're going after, when you have people that are in prison, you can't guarantee what people are gonna do when they get out. That's exactly right. But I have seen myself, I have seen quantitative and qualitative proof that by being in and utilizing uh, intellectual and scientific and faith-based approaches Two individuals. These are our people. That's right. We can talk to us. That's exactly we right. We can talk to us. And, and we should talk to us. We should talk to us. And by doing so, I have have witnessed and have participated, and I thank God for this. I've seen so many young men, so many young men. I don't go into the women's prisons. I just don't feel like that's the place for me to be. Uh, but I've seen so many young men come out of these prisons and make a complete change because they were, their circumstances uh, by being in prison, they took advantage of those circumstances. Yes, they looked around and realized that uh, the trick was on them. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've seen individuals who are what you would call shooters. Mm. You know, I mean, hardcore young men that you, you you know you wonder how can you live such a short life and be so hard so fast. Yeah, but they're hardcore. But bringing practical, and I I mean practical information pragmatic information, can-do information to individuals, 
I've seen lives change, and I've seen those very individuals come out, and many of them are out right now, and they are stellar contributors in society. And that, so as a faith community, one of the things that I believe we should put more emphasis on is the redemption of our people. If Amen. we believe that redemption is possible, we should go to the, the, the lowest. As you said, go start at the bottom. That's right. Start at the bottom and work our way up. That's right. You know what? You talked about there being an elephant in the room, yeah. and we don't want to see him. So yeah. we go either, either have to eat him or yeah. drag him out. If you just tuned in, we're talking to Imam Mikhail Shabazz. And I tell you what, we're having a spirited conversation about what everybody needs to be talking about, the incarceration uh, and the disparities where it concerns African-American men, especially in our penal system of America. There must be change change practices that contributed to these disparities. Disproportionate representation of African Americans is hideous. And other minorities in Oregon, especially in our state prisons, we must reduce Oregon's over-reliance on incarceration as a response to crime and social programs and shift toward more effective evidence-based programs proven to reduce future crime. Imam, we have been so blessed to have you here with us today. What didn't we say that we ought to be saying? That there's more to come. There's more to come. <laughs> there's more to come. And we're going to leave that there. Thank you for watching tonight. If you like this video, please give a thumbs up and let me know what you think in the comment sections below. And please share this with your friends and neighbors so that they might be inspired too. Turn on your notifications so you never miss a thing for Mondays with Mondanay. Thank you, Poshans, for feeding the staff tonight. Thank you, Auntie and Tante's Child Care, for taking care of our children. You can visit me at Celebration Tabernacle in Portland, Oregon on Sunday mornings. And I want you to know something. We've got to be prepared, and it's always important to play your part and do your best for community, God, and country. Thank you, your mom for being here tonight, and more power to you, my brother. Power's to be shared. Hey, man. Hey, man. Hey, it's time for you to come to Post Shine. Check out that catfish sandwich. Oh, my goodness, is that the shrimp, po oh boy? Man, look at that chocolate chip cake. Man, I need to get over to Post Shine's at 8139 North Denver right now because this food looks delicious. Or call, if you'd like, 503-978-9000. And don't miss it. You'll be sorry. In times gone past,